Hey folks, welcome back to the History of the Republican Party, where we have gotten ourselves up to the election of Woodrow Wilson, who was, of course, not a Republican, he's a Democrat, and that's going to cause some problems for the Republicans. So let me go ahead and round up where we were last week and um, and how the, I am, I'm taking you forward from the progressives and how the progressives under Teddy Roosevelt and fighting Bob LaFollette and Henry Cabot Lodge um, and Albert Beveridge really wrested control of the party from the old guard, the really pro-business 1890, 1900 pro-business uh, Republicans who really just wanted to protect business with that, that protective tariff and how the progressives wrested control of the, of the party from them really by appealing to the American people uh, through things like Teddy Roosevelt's uh, bully pulpit, as he said, he worked very closely with the media and so therefore changed the way um, uh, uh, Americans thought about uh, the government and what it should be doing, but also um, by, um, by, uh, appealing to to new ideas of what uh, the government should do and and by by getting to that point by taking a look at their idea that American values should spread overseas so their argument the the progressives argument is that if America is so ducky that it you know that the the Republican Party should stay in power forever it should spread those values overseas and if it's going to spread those values overseas it better be living by them at home and so that's what I argued last week brought us the progressive wing of the Republican Party. So what happens then, though, in 1912, when you have such a dramatic election? Um, and, and I always have to laugh about the election of 1912. That is, I remember when I took my qualifying exams to get into graduate school, one of the questions was, who ran in 1912? And I'm like, who knows? <laughs> but now I know. And I know why it was important, because that's an election in which all four of the major characters running uh, are running as progressives, essentially. And that's the election of 1912, when Eugene V. Debs, who runs as a socialist, gets the highest percentage of votes that a socialist ever gets in an American election. And he gets about 900,000 votes, which is a little bit less than 1% of the population. So every time I read, I hear that and I say that, the fact that Americans have been so obsessed with the dangers of socialism really since 1871 is astonishing when the best the socialists have ever done in an election is less than 1% of the vote. Just throwing that out there. All right. Um, that being said, uh, so what happens? We get the election of 1912. And with the election of 1912, um, Republicans sort of panic. I mean, the Republican candidates, which are going to be, uh, uh, not going to be, they were, William Howard Taft running somewhat as a conservative, but as I said, he busted more trusts than Teddy Roosevelt did. And Teddy Roosevelt running as a Bull Moose uh, candidate at, on a new party ticket, the Bull Moose candidate, the two of them got by far the most votes of, you know, in, in the election, but they split the Republican vote. And what that did is it permitted Woodrow Wilson to be elected. Woodrow Wilson is a Democrat. I'm not going to have a chance to talk a lot about him today, but this is a really important moment in American history and in the history of the Democratic Party because a lot of the patterns that we um, that uh, that we now associate with the Democrats are laid down during Woodrow Wilson's term. And you may sit there and you say, like, that's crazy. Like Woodrow Wilson was like, oh, you know, he was back there with M Methuselah, right? Like he was a forever ago. A reminder here that my father was born during Woodrow Wilson's term. So we're not looking at, you know, I knew a man who was alive during Woodrow Wilson's term. So, you know, it seems like it's forever, especially to the younger people who might be listening, but it's really not all that long. So, you know, I listened to a man talk about politics who grew up in Woodrow Wilson's America. So we're talking really only one generation there. And so a lot of what happens with Wilson is of note and is important. And it's also kind of cool. And I will say that one of the things I like about this period, and you know, the honestly, I think like many other people, I find the Wilson um, uh, presidency a little bit dry. Um, and and what's happening in the, you know, and the, the politics of the, the Wilson presidency a little bit you know, black and white, and, and no pun intended there, because of course he's going to uh, usher in resegregation into Washington, D.C. But while he might not be that exciting to me, I'm sorry if you're a Wilson fan, um, what's happening in the country is 
enormously exciting. There's new languages, there's new people, there's new books, there's new ideas, there's new, there's new uh, technology by the 1920s. It's going to really change America. So I'll get into that today as well. All right, so what happens is Woodrow Wilson, and I'm sorry, I'm going to give you some of the personalities here because that I do find interesting. So Woodrow Wilson gets elected, and Woodrow Wilson is a really interesting character because he has actually grown up in Columbia, South Carolina during the crisis of um, 1876, 1877. His family actually lived right there by the state house in South Carolina, and his home is now a museum um, there in Columbia. Uh, which is kind of interesting. It's a museum to that era, not to Woodrow Wilson, but to, um, although of course they mentioned him, but to what was happening in Columbia at the time. But literally, I mean, the, like I talked about the other day about how the the troops were just down the road from the state house. Wilson's house, the house he grew up in, is is about the same distance across the in the other direction, you know, on the other side. And um, so he's he's watched that, and he has soaked up what's happening in South Carolina and the idea of African Americans really not being welcome in American society because they're going to vote to redistribute wealth. So he's grown up in that, but then he goes on to get a degree in political science. Maybe that's why I find him a little bit dry as I've read his books and page turners they are not. Um, but then he goes on and becomes a professor in, uh, in at Princeton. And he's a professor of political science and his wife is a southerner. And so she actually goes home to have their babies because she doesn't want no uh, expletive. She doesn't want her, her children to be Yankees. So you, you got to remember that Wilson is uh, a southerner. And he is um, associated with Virginia, but he also lived in South Carolina. But he is a professor from New Jersey. So he, um, he as soon as he's elected, he, um, he really sees himself on a mission in a number of ways. And he can, he's picking up on that progressivism in the country, not just on the Republican side, but also on the Democratic side. But it's really important to remember that the, the Democrats are coming at progressivism from a completely different space than the Republicans are. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the Democrats now. I might do a whole series on the history of the Democrats, if that's interesting. And I mean, it, it's interesting to me. It may not be interesting to you, but um, but it's worth remembering. I want to focus on the Republicans today, but it's worth remembering that even though Wilson is going to end up in many places that are quite similar to where the Republicans wanted to end up, they're coming at it in, from entirely different angles. And that's not really entirely clear to people watching. They just want the good legislation. But to, to Wilson and to the Republicans who are controlling their party, those differences are really important. So what happens? The first thing that Wilson does after he's elected is he goes ahead and he writes a new budget. Now, this is before Congress has even come back into session. So he writes a new budget and he, um, as soon as Congress, actually even before Congress comes into session officially, he starts talking to Congress people and congressmen and he basically twists their arm to get on board with his new budget, um, kind of by wheeling and dealing, you know, and and it's it, you know, he's really coming out of the box saying, I'm going to take on um, on the system we've got, and I'm going to fix this system. And this, of course, infuriates the Republicans, who were like, you know, we were doing just fine without you, thank you very much. And then, he, I'm sorry, then Wilson makes matters worse, because he um, he insists on, you, you know, I kind of threw out a few weeks ago that traditionally, I guess it was last week with Teddy Roosevelt, that really since the, the very early days of American politics, the presidents have not given their, um, their, uh, uh, message to Congress, their yearly message to Congress in person. They did way back, I think it was John Adams was the last one to do it. But from then on, they simply they simply um, de hand delivered the message to the clerk of the, of, uh, the House of Representatives and the clerk theoretically read it. But basically um, it, it gets put in the record and, you know, no one pays a lot of attention, to be honest. And sometimes they might pick up on it, but but maybe not. When when Lincoln does this with his first message to Congress, he puts some highfalutin language in it. And when Congress sits to talk about it, they go. So they were talking about what parts of the message should go to different committees. And they read that part, and someone said, "We don't know where to send it because we don't have a Department of Metaphysics or a Committee of Metaphysics." Um, so they don't take it all that seriously. Well, Woodrow Wilson comes in, and he insists on giving it in person. So, and he's a college professor. So he literally lectures to these men. So he has not been in Washington. He has been um, at the state level. And he comes in and he makes them all sit in their chairs and listen to him 
lecture them about how the country should be organized. And I cannot tell you how badly this rubs a lot of people, especially the Republicans who are like, you are, we know this town, you do not, and you're treating us like, like school children and we want no part of it. All right, so, um, so what he does is he lays out a number of reforms to American society that are centered there's a lot of them that are centered around uh, the social reforms that I talked about before, and those are fairly popular in America, but Woodrow Wilson's going for the money. You know, he's going to reform the finances, and this is not something that the Republicans like at all. Um, they, they, you know, people like Teddy Roosevelt wanted to, to rein in big business, but they liked the system the way it was. Woodrow Wilson's like, no, the system is, is a problem. So the first thing he does is he makes it clear that he is going to get rid of those Republican tariffs to protect business and lower the tariffs so that they only produce revenue, which is what the Democrats had always wanted to do. But what happens in 1913 with the Revenue Act of 1913 is that the Democrats do lower that tariff, but they also um, replace the lost money with an income tax. Now that is uh, because of the new amendment to the Constitution that Taft signed. Remember, as I talked about all the all those weeks ago. It's the Republican Party that invents the income tax. So when the um, the Republicans in 1894 say there's no way Democrats can put on an income tax and the Supreme Court in Pollock v. Farmers, uh, Farmers Loan says no, it's unconstitutional. Even Taft is like, oh, come on, guys, we have to have the power to tax. So he actually helps facilitate the, um, the new amendment to the Constitution. And it is in place in time for Woodrow Wilson to use it in 1913, in the Revenue Act of 1913. Now, why am I making a big deal out of that? Because, again, I hang out occasionally, just for observing purposes, um, in the fever swamps of the internet. And there is a long standing conspiracy in certain circles that that act, the Revenue Act of 1913, was the start of all of our troubles, that with the income tax, and that it was unconstitutional. And so you still will see references to the Revenue Act of 1913, and you still will see people talking about how it's the Democrats who invent the income tax based on the Revenue Act of 1913. Both of those things you now know are untrue. It's the Republicans who invent the income tax, and the Revenue Act of 1913 simply rejiggers the balance between these protective tariffs that were protecting big business and income taxes. What that does, of course, is it shifts the burden of taxation from ordinary Americans who had to pay the tariffs to people of means who actually had to, um, to pony up some cash thanks to the income tax. But that's not all that Woodrow Wilson does. Um, and, and the Democrats under Woodrow Wilson do. They actually launch an investigation into the influence of money in American politics. And honestly, I find this absolutely fascinating. It is, uh, they, they put together a committee by, um, overseen by a guy named Arsene Pujol from Louisiana. And he looks into the relationship between money and politics. And this becomes known as the Pujol Committee. You may have heard that P-U-J-O Committee. And what they discover is they start to dig into the influence of um, uh, J.P. Morgan on business. And what they find is that, and what historians have established, is that beginning about 1890, when you get the extraordinary capitalization of things like U.S. Steel and, and um, Northern, the Northern Securities uh, Group that I talked about last week, because they are capitalized at such a high level, uh, there's so much money in them. The bankers are insisting on having a say in the way those companies are run, which kind of makes sense. It's their money, right? So um, what the Peugeot Committee discovers is that J.P. Morgan has has uh, his hand in most of the major corporations in America. And people are horrified because what the equation that the Peugeot Committee lays down is that you put your money in the bank, you and me, us ordinary people, my dad's family, right, back when he was being born, put your money into, uh, uh, into a bank, and the bank then uses that money to create this juggernaut of industry over which you have no control. And this is where we get the book by Louis Br Louis Brandeis, who's going to be a, a very famous Supreme Court um, justice, um, called Other People's Money. And the, the book Other People's Money, Brandeis's book Other People's Money, which you can get on the internet, is basically a popularization of the Peugeot Committee's report. 
And it's just amazing reading. It's it's really just amazing reading. So if you're at all interested, it's called Other People's Money. You, you might have read it in college. It's still in print after all these years. Um, but but the, you know the the um, the country looks at this at the Peugeot report and then at Louis Brandeis's Other People's Money, and they're like, this is a problem. We have a problem. And so what they do is um, in 1913. Um, uh, I mean, they obviously they want to rein in the bankers. So one of the things the Democrats do is again in 1913, they construct a new system of American banking. And that new system of American banking is our federal, re federal reserve system. And then what's interesting about the federal reserve system and the reason it matters to me today for a talk about the Republican party is because it removes bankers from being in control of the system and puts the government in control of the system. And this is a big change. And it's a big change that infuriates Republicans, especially Republican ind industrialists and bankers, because they have, they have now have oversight. And that's our federal reserve system that we still have. It's been changed a lot, but that's where it comes from. And that's why it's there. All right. Um, so what else goes on? This is this is popular in the country. This stuff is popular. And it, that's an interesting story, too, because it's popular enough that Republicans in the West, who don't like the Republicans in the East for various reasons, start to look at Woodrow Wilson and think, you know, I'm not entirely sure we don't like these guys. And I've written about that in my um, in the, the new book. Um, but they there you start to see a weakening in the West of the Republican Party, which starts to say, you know, uh, maybe the, the Democrats aren't so bad. And those people are going to shift over to FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s, kind of without a backward glance. Um, and this is when they start to weaken is over these issues, these financial issues right now. That is probably more than anybody wants to know. But I like it because the Eastern Republicans get so angry at the Western Republicans, they start to call them the sons of the wild jackass, which is just such a fun epithet that has been lost to history. I always like bringing them in. Anyway, all right. So this stuff's popular. And the Republicans really can't fight back against it because it's very hard to go before the people and defend uh, J.P. Morgan. I mean, you know, he's a, he's kind of a man without a friend, right? So, um, so, uh, but there is a place on in which uh, the Republic, the Democrats, I'm sorry, are vulnerable, and this really matters in the long term because they're vulnerable with the fact that Wilson puts at the State Department uh, William Jennings Bryan. And that's an obvious thing for him to do. Brian is a very well-known Democrat, the most well-known Democrat in the country. He is uh, very popular among the Democrats, but he also has the reputation of being anti-war. He was against imperialism in the Republican Party in the in the previous administration. And he, um, he, of course, in 1896, had been characterized by the Republicans across the country as being an anarchist, a socialist, you know, he was going to destroy the country. And the idea that Brian is sitting at state, which in the time was considered a stepping stone to the, to the presidency, really horrified a lot of people who might otherwise have switched to the Democratic Party. And it makes the Democrats very vulnerable on issues of national security. And I'm going to argue that the insertion of Brian at state by the Democrats in this era is going to mark the Democrats as being disloyal and un-American from this period on. They always are perceived as being weak on communism, weak on national defense. And this is a huge jump and it's the Democrats. And I know this is not what I promised to talk about, but I think I could make a pretty good case that one of the reasons that John F. Kennedy goes into the Bay of Pigs is because, I know that's a leap for a lot of you, but it's because he doesn't want to be perceived as weak on national security. Eisenhower could get away with not going in, JFK can't. Anyway, big jump there, I'll go back. Brian's at state. So foreign affairs is going to be a big deal for the um, for the Democrats. Uh, the Republicans are going to be able to hit on, and that's where I'm going to end today. Um, but they've also got a number of other things that worry the Republicans, some Republicans, the old guard Republicans, not the progressives. Um, the, uh, and those things are these. We have the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, and the 17th is enormously, imp enormously important because the 17th is... Um, the amendment that says that senators should be directly elected rather than elected by the legislature. And you hear sometimes calls nowadays to get rid of that. 
and they infuriate me because the reason that we got the 17th in the first place is because it was so easy to buy up a legislature that basically, literally in this period, senators like Nelson Aldrich, you're going to hear more about, um, literally called themselves the senator for the jute trust or the senator for the sugar trust. They literally were bought by those people. So what would happen is if you're a rich guy, you go to the Senate, uh, I'm sorry, you go to the state legislature and you say, I want my guy, I want, you know, Nelson Aldrich in the Senate, although Nelson Aldrich didn't need to have that kind of backing, but I, I want my guy in there, my car, oh, here you go. Um, it, um, oh, the guy from Nevada who's escaping my name, he literally is put into the Senate um, he lives in California, but he represents Nevada in the Senate because he represents uh, mining and railroad interests. Um, I just wrote about him in the last book. Maybe somebody can remember. I can't. Um, I wrote, oh my God, I read three biographies of him. Anyway, um, so uh, so the, what you would simply do is I say, I want my guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy the legislature. And they do. And legislatures are cheap. So the art, I mean, there aren't that many of them. I'm not saying they're, they're sold easily, but there aren't that many of them. It's easier to buy a legislature than it is to buy an election. So the idea behind the 17th and the popular election of senators was again to reduce the influence of money in politics. So that's what's happening uh, with the 17th. And you also get Woodrow Wilson backing uh, women's suffrage. Again, with the idea at the time, and I really won't go into this now, but with the idea at the time that women were more moral, they were purer, and they would be harder to corrupt than men would. So you have under Wilson this movement toward the popular um, enthusiasms of the progressive era. But at the same time, um, Woodrow Wilson, as I mentioned, is tarred by the Republican Party as a Confederate. And this is not a, a, a capital C Confederate, a, a, an adherent to the ideology of the Confederacy. And that's not entirely unfair in the sense that his father was a chaplain with the Confederate armies. And he, of course, was a Southerner. And his writings were um, were absolutely racially biased, and he resegregated Washington D.C., which had not been segregated since the Civil War. And um, he just he was sort of a, a, a not sort of he was a, an un, unrepentant Southern racist who wanted to change American politics to get rid of any influence of African Americans on it. Um, that being said, he does show Birth of a Nation in the White House. But John Hope Franklin is one of our greatest historians, uh, maintained that he never actually said those lines that are attributed to him about it being like history written with lightning. Um, but that he, this, he kind of got backed into having to show the film because he went to school with um, the guy who, uh, who wrote, I think wrote the book, not filmed, either wrote the book or filmed the movie. I'll just off the top of my head, I don't remember. Anyway, so so there is this idea that Woodrow Wilson is disloyal, disloyal to America. He is a Confederate, right? And at the same time, he's going after moneyed men. And at the same time, you've got uh, um, William Jennings Bryan at state. And when World War I breaks out in Europe, Woodrow Wilson professes neutrality, keeps professing neutrality. He wants to stay neutral. This, the Republicans grab hold of and say, you are disloyal, you don't want to protect America, you don't want to go into this, this war. And Teddy Roosevelt um, um, uh, is sort of unhinged at this point. I mean, it, it, if you read his stuff, and there's a lot of his stuff uh, available on Google Books, um, you can see, if you read it in order, you can see his mind is, um, is weakening. And his mind is weakening, and as it weakens, his ego is getting stronger, which says something for Teddy Roosevelt, let me tell you. But he basically says, I'm going to go fight because you're a traitor. And there's no way. He's an old man at this point. He's a broken old man. He's gotten every kind of disease under the sun on that trip down the Nile or whatever it was, the Amazon. And But he... Um, but you can see this building fury on the part of the Republican Party. And it's a fury that's fueled by partisanship as well as by a real conviction that America should go into World War I. But this, can, this idea that like they're, they, people like Teddy Roosevelt have this almost visceral sense that this Confederate, this disloyal man is holding America back from doing what is the moral and right and capital R Republican thing to do. So this, um, this, uh, um, this fury builds 
And of course, you know, with when Wilson is reelected in 1916, the um, the slogan that his men adopt for him is he kept us out of war because Americans really don't want to go into another war. And um, uh, and Woodrow Wilson didn't like that slogan at all because he knew he could not promise that he wouldn't take people to war. Anyway, I'm giving you too much on Woodrow Wilson. But um, but so what happens then, let's get back to the Republicans, is that in um, in 19, uh, America does have to go into the war, and um, after the uh, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 in Russia, um, uh, uh, Americans are really concerned, increasingly concerned about the rise of communism, and the rise of communism in America is so the the, the way Americans perceive it is so different than any other country because for Americans. The idea of communism and world communism links right back to that Reconstruction era, the 1971-18, sorry, 1871 era, when the idea of an activist government that was trying to level the playing field for newly uh, freed enslaved people was redistributing wealth from hardworking white taxpayers to people of color. And so the rise of Bolshevism in Russia in 1917, uh, you know, the, the that's its own story. And the way Europe reacted to that is its own story. And the way, you know, Asia reacted to it is its own story. The way Africa reacted is its own story. And by the way, a very interesting story. And um, one of my colleagues works on that. But the way America reacts to it is really enveloped by the way America sees itself at that point. So what happens then is that, let's get back to the Republicans, is that we got, we got the midterm election in 1918 coming up and the war is over. Uh, for the, uh, or it's clear it's going to be over. And um, Woodrow Wilson has already begun talking about the end of the war with um, with uh, uh, other other foreign, uh, other European leaders. And they have come up with the idea of this League of Nations. And this comes out of the progressive era, the idea that you can solve anything if only you can talk reasonably about it. And they've made a bunch of mistakes in the negotiations over that, not least that they put their principles out there, principals, P -A -N, the big guys, the, the leaders actually sat down to talk. Bad idea in negotiations ever to put your leaders out front because you, there's no wiggle room, which is one of the reasons that they did it that way. But a good negotiator, um, and you can see this all over some of the great um, indigenous negotiators we've had, like Red Cloud, for example. A good negotiator doesn't put the big guys out front because you need to buy space and time for um, to make little adjustments without the world watching. You know, because basically, if two people are at different places, you gotta have a lot of rub room in between. Well, they didn't do that. They they put their big guys out front, and that was a mistake, because it doesn't give them any wiggle room. Anyway. So Wilson has backed this League of Nations, the idea that so long, he gives up a lot in that treaty, but he, the Treaty of Versailles, but he, um, he, he says, I don't care that I'm giving all, this away, giving all this stuff away because so long as we have a League of Nations, we can fix it. But then he makes a mistake that the Republicans jump all over. And that is that he goes in front of the country in 1918, which is a midterm election. I know we don't pay a lot of attention to midterm elections all the time, but we should because some of them are crucial goes in front of the country in um, 1918 and he says, you need to vote for me because we need to get this League of Nations. And the Republicans go ballistic. That's when the door opens for them to regain control over a very popular president because they say, oh, wait a minute. We thought we were fighting this war for America. You're saying we are fighting this war for the Democrats. And what you're trying to do is you're going to you're trying to cut the Dem the Republicans out of negotiations about this League of Nations. This is appalling. And what this means is that you, Woodrow Wilson, have sold out America to your buddies over there in Europe. And what you are trying to do is to get rid of American legal systems and replace them with a one world government. That should sound familiar. That's the grounds on which Henry Cabot Lodge, who, by the way, loathes Woodrow Wilson ever since he goes after the tariff way back in 1913 um, and, and has been looking for an opening 
in this whole period. Um, he goes ballistic over this, and he's the guy who manages to kill the Treaty of Versailles uh, and the League of Nations by forcing, for example, um, he's at the head of the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, making uh, making them read every single word of the treaty on the floor of the Senate, which takes forever, and really slowing it down and killing popular enthusiasm for it. And Woodrow Wilson digs his heels in, and he says, either do it, my, he says to his supporters in Congress, either you, either you get it my way or you reject it, because I'm not going to let him water it down. And what that means, of course, is the treaty gets rejected, and we don't get the League of Nations. Interestingly enough, I was having a conversation the other day with a friend um, who studies a World War II, a, a, he's a Germanist, and he was saying, you know, I've always wondered if that abdication of the League of Nations was really at the heart of the coming of World War II, if America had signed on to that, if we would have had World War II. I am not a Germanist, I'm not a Europeanist, and I had never thought of that. I'm not endorsing it or, um, or objecting to it. I just thought it was a really interesting perspective. All right, so why do we care about this? What did you just hear there? You heard about the idea of the Republicans that any cooperation with foreign governments is working toward a one world state is taking away the, the Declaration of Independence, taking away the Constitution, taking away laws, that this is going to destroy America. I'm sorry if I'm getting excited, but isn't that exactly what you have been hearing in the American right since Eisenhower? That's where it all starts, right here with the League of Nations. All right, so what happens? What happens is interesting because um, after World War I, uh, nobody really understands the effect that the government spending for World War I has had on the economy. So what they do immediately after, when, when, the, when the guns fall silent on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, it's the Armistice Day, right? When that happens, um, everybody who's got a government contract or all the, the government contractors literally get on the telephones and they call all their suppliers and they say, we're canceling the contracts. And it, there's so many calls that they actually, um, um, you can't actually make a phone call in Washington that day because the, the lines are all jammed. So what that does is it throws the, the United States into a short-term recession. It's going to be short-term, but of course, that doesn't matter when you're in it, right? It feels like it's going on forever. So um, um, there, the, with the, the, everybody getting thrown out of work in the winter, which is not good because you're not going to be able to buy coal, for example, to heat your house and people need food. Never a good idea to be out of work in the winter. I mean, any time. But winter strikes and winter uh, recessions tend to be harder than summer recessions. Summer recessions bring people out on the street, but winter recessions make people suffer more because of the heat issue, um, at least in, in the American uh, Northeast and Northwest. Anyway, um, there are strikes across the country after World War One, and of course, there's also the the pandemic, um, the the um, the um, uh, the Spanish flu, which starts in Kansas, by the way. They call it Spanish for stupid reasons, anyway, um, or or public media reasons. But anyway, um, so there's strikes across the country. People are dying because of the pandemic, and no one knows really what's going to happen next. When we've rejected this introduction to the foreign having an influence on in foreign affairs and with the rise of bolshevism so you, republicans look at this chaos after world war one and the strikes and the the deaths and they say we are looking at communism coming to america communism has arrived in america and this plays out really dramatically in boston in september of 1918 with the police strike. And with the Boston, the Boston police go on strike and with the Boston police on strike, which by the way, is a really interesting story. And there's a lot of fun um, anecdotes about just how, um, how Boston looks. It's so Boston, the way people react to this. Like some guys actually go and shoot craps on the, um, on the staircase in front of the Boston police building, for example, just to prove that they can. And Boston decides that it's going to gather its its loyal best citizens and create their own ad hoc police force. And one of the groups they turn to, believe it or not, is the Harvard football team. Um, anyway, uh, with the Boston police strike, uh, the um, the uh, uh, um, governor of Massachusetts, governor of Massachusetts. Yes, the governor of Massachusetts. I'm wondering if he's mayor of Boston, but I don't think so. He's the governor of Massachusetts. Car uh, Cal Calvin Coolidge breaks the strike. And he says at the time that there is no 
um, uh, there is you can it is not there is no striking against the public interest at any time anywhere for any reason I don't have that quote exactly right but it's going to be really important in 1981 I think it is because Ronald Reagan uses the exact same line to break the air traffic controllers strike uh, at the beginning of his term um, there can be no defense against the um, striking against public interest or something like that so would I'm sorry Calvin Coolidge who is uh, a, an interesting character, um, famous for not saying anything, but there was actually a reason for that, um, becomes kind of the hero of, uh, the popular hero of the Boston police strike by saying, I don't care if you're not getting wages, I don't care if you're in chaos, I don't care any of that stuff, get back to work. And he becomes the symbol of the, the stance of Republicans against what people are increasingly are afraid is communism. So things continue to be rough in America in 1919 and 19, 1918, 1919, and 1920. And you know, I assume, about the fact that 1918 and 1919 are known as the time of the Red Scare, that summer is known as the Red Summer. And that's a pun both on the fact that, they, that Americans were afraid the Reds were coming, communism was associated with the color red, but also because it was such a bloody summer. Because you have the strikes that are obviously, I've indicated, are labor based, but you also have extraordinary race riots across the country, primarily in the South and the West, but not limited to them, in, in which uh, the, the African American soldiers coming home are attacked for their um, their insistence that they should should um, should participate in American society. So we have really extraordinary. Um, extraordinary events where where people who, who had been with the Harlem Hellfighters, which are some of the most decorated soldiers in American history, um, came home and were lynched, you know, were killed. And um, I mean, it's just what uh, and and but not just the soldiers coming home. Also, the dislocation of World War One, the fact that so many African Americans had been funneled by the government out of the South into war factories in other places, primarily the North, um, creates all kinds of uh, social strife from white people who don't want black people moving into their jobs and into their neighborhoods. And we get, uh, you'll get by 1921, of course, the Tulsa race riot, which is, um, it's wrong word, race massacre. Um, be, when when um, the white people in Tulsa basically burned to the ground, one of the most prosperous African American communities in the country, and I always remember the Tulsa race riot for a number of reasons, obviously, but in part because that is the first time in American history that an American cit city um, or town was firebombed from the air, and the people in Tulsa were firebombed from private planes that were. Uh, people either their own private planes or chartered private planes to fly over the Greenwood district of Tulsa and drop bombs on the people. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it, it just seems to me to be a, a, something that should be in every textbook. But again, like the ma largest mass execution in American history, that's the first time Americans have, which was the, the um, Dakotas in uh, 1862. This is the first time an American city has been, fi been bombed from the air and it's Tulsa. Anyway, so you're going to have race riots all over. I will also sort of put in a social note here the migration of African Americans out of the South, up the Mississippi River into Chicago during this period is what makes Chicago one of the great leading cities of blues, is because that, that music uh, from the South, which is based uh, obviously in the South and in the, the musical traditions of the African American community, begins to travel up the Mississippi River into Chicago. And that's why Chicago is such an incredible blues city. Thankfully, that's where we get the Blues Brothers, right? But that's also where we get, um, well, all of it. Anyway, Jelly Roll Morton. Anyway, um, uh, back to this. All right, so so it looks crazy in the, in the country, and you see this increasing conflict between people who are striking and unhappy with the situation, the the, the post-war situation, and the the increasing backlash of a white community and a Republican community against people of color, against laborers especially. And you see this coming to a head in May of 1920, when um, two Italian immigrants, um, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, are, um, 
are arrested in Braintree, Massachusetts for the arrest, I'm sorry, for the murder of a paymaster there. Now, historians think that they were likely involved in that, but they become the symbol of uh, the, the government, a repressive government destroying all opposition to it, which is um, really the theme of the, the 19, uh, 19, 19 teens and the 1920s after World War I. So you've got Sacco and Vanzetti arrested in 1920, which becomes a flashpoint across the country. They are going to be executed later on. And when they are, there are protests against the execution on every continent in the world except Antarctica, because there's no one there. And the, and the penguins don't care. Um, I think there are penguins there. I'm sorry, I'm not a biologist. I'm just being flippant. Uh, because it's two o'clock on a beautiful sunny day. Um, but then there's also another event that fascinates me, always fascinates me. It's right up there with Jimmy Hoffa, which by the way, there is um, new evidence, really interesting, really interesting evidence about where Jimmy Hoffa might be buried. And uh, there's an article that was just published on the Mob Museum website. Um, it's a very long article, maybe more than most people want, but you know I'm obsessed with that case. If I knew where Jimmy Hoffa were, was buried, not that it matters really, I just am interested. Um, the next thing I would wonder about is this, this thing that I'm gonna tell you about. And that is um, uh, in September of 1920, there is a bombing in America. And that bombing is on Wall Street. The bombing is right next to JP Morgan's bank. And if you go there now today, uh, you will see they've left the marks on the bank um, the bank building from that bomb. And we have never found out who set that bomb or nobody ever claimed, con, uh, claimed um, responsibility for it. But interestingly enough, as with so many things like that, uh, the people who were hurt were not JP Morgan or the bankers. It was the people in the street around the bombing. But anyway, I would dearly love um, um, the, to know where that, that, um, that, that, uh, the who who actually set that bomb? Yeah, I'm just looking over here. Somebody said um, they're horrified that I said that we get the Blues Brothers from the the, the African American music moving up. That was not intended to be any kind of um, uh, statement about the the magic of the blues, which is an African American thing. I often throw in popular references like that. Who, for people who might not know the deeper history. And that's not to say that in any way that uh, the Blues Brothers movie, which was brilliant in its own way, was, uh, was why we should care about the blues. It was a way for people who uh, don't know the blues to say, oh, wait a minute, I remember that movie. I should learn more about the blues. So, um, so I, I'm sorry if that offended anybody. I, I obviously would not be teaching a course in the blues using that reference, but I might advertise a course in the blues using that reference with the idea I'd get people who didn't otherwise know about it. So if I offended anybody by that, I'm sorry about that. All right, uh, let me go back to the the the, the, uh, the um, Republican stuff though. And that is that you can see here building on the Republican side an anti-communism that is going to um, really, really, take over the, the party and, and take over the country as people push the media and Republican leaders and to some degree Democratic leaders, including Woodrow Wilson, push back against communism and back against Bolshevism. And um, from this, we get the election in 1920 of Warren G. Harding. And what's interesting about Warren G. Harding is that he's not much. I mean, he's from Marion, Ohio. He's a, a journalist, a good looking man or perceived so at the time. And he, um, um, when he is nominated in, 19, in, the, in the Republican convention in 1920, the Republican convention that year is really boring. I mean, like it goes on a lot, but like this, there's no, the, the speeches are dull. What's really interesting about the convention though in 1920 is there are no progressives. There's one guy who tries to speak up for Republican progressive values and they shout him down. They say he's a communist. They don't want any part of him. So by 1920, you've got the party having gone back to its 1890 roots, but they can't agree on a candidate. And they, they throw up a bunch of names. Nobody really wants any of them. And finally somebody, and, I, and I'm exaggerating here a bit, but finally somebody says, well, what about Harding? And somebody else is like, yeah, that's cool. 
and and literally the, the nomination speeches for him are like this long in a, in a, in the book that's published about it and you know it's he's really lackluster but whatever they just want a party wheel horse and a wheel horse of course is the horse at the wheel who does what he's told they want a party wheel horse to do what the party wants and he seems to fit the bill good looking man keep his mouth shut do what he's told and he says that he is not up for that gig that he's not that he's just not that bright i don't think that's fair i think he's just he's not he just doesn't have a lot of breadth he's not stupid he's a journalist but he's a small town boy and he doesn't he doesn't understand the forces around him uh, this by the way is where in this convention is where we get the concept of the smoke filled room that's from an article written at the time about how we got harding is that he came from a smoke filled room that's where this comes from it's about the only thing that's memorable about the 1920 um um uh Republican National Convention. But what's important on that ticket, the 1920 ticket, is that while Harding might not be very visible, Coolidge is. Coolidge becomes the vice president and he becomes the voice and the symbol of anti-communism, anti-Bolshevism in America in 1920. So Harding gets into office and he is not really up for the task. He is managed by people uh, and he he knows he's not really up for the task. He basically likes to gamble. He plays bridge. He's a bridge gambler. Um, he likes to gamble. He likes to drink. He likes to smoke. By the way, it's time for, for prohibition. It's prohibition uh, is in force here, and he smokes and drinks upstairs in the White House. And he's also a womanizer. About maybe 10 years ago, the rumors that he had had a child out of wedlock um, are were confirmed that you know it was considered a smear at the time. It's pretty clear his wife knew it was going on, and there were rumors when he died that she killed him. She did not, um, but but he um, because she was mad about the mistress. But um, but it turns out the mistress was true, and so was the baby. Anyway, um, Harding basically turns things over to um, uh, to uh, his cronies to people who seem to know more than him and who are you know who drink with him and smoke with him and party with him and you know this is going nowhere good right he to to my understanding of harding and he doesn't interest me all that much so i could dig deeper than i have he himself does not seem like he's on the take but he's not discerning about the people around him and they are so long as they're good friends of his he's willing to look the other way so what he does is We've got an issue here in this in this, the way the government works, because basically the president has checked out. He's there, but he's drinking. You know, he, he's just it's it's too much for him. And Congress, so the power should have flowed to Congress, flowed to Congress. But Congress um, can't really do much because the Republicans have gone in this in 1920 from being an opposition party to being a, a party in control. And that transition is very, very difficult. Almost no party does that well. That first generation of we're in control now generally screws things up. Not always, but generally screws things up because the the skill set you need to oppose things is really different than the skill set you need to advance things. So one of the reasons that on that uh, the, that web page I have, I'm trying to keep looking, having people looking forward, simply so that you you help that transition from being opposition to being in control. Because otherwise, everybody's just sort of throwing up their hands, and their skill set is in resisting, not in promoting. And that's what happens in Congress. The Republican Congress really kind of falls dead in the water, and it it ends up infighting, and the power doesn't really flow there. Where the power flows is to the executive branch. And the executive branch, Harding turns over to really strong personalities and really very talented men. And the ones that I want to mention today, and I will go past the two o'clock block just because I started seven minutes after. I'll stop seven minutes after. Um, the power really goes to um, Herbert Hoover, who's Secretary of Commerce, and to Andrew Mellon, who's Secretary of the Treasury. And those two men are going to dramatically to shape what America looks like in the 1920s under Harding and later under Coolidge when Harding dies. And what they do is they begin to use the government really to promote business. And Hoover does this really consciously. He insists that the government's job should not be to regulate business the way it had done under Will Woodrow Wilson. It should be to promote business. And so he puts businessmen in control of, um, of uh, 
all the different offices. He changes American policy to promote business overseas. This is his big thing. And he manages to, to consolidate power and to push American business across the country and overseas. He wants things humming along. And at the same time, Andrew Mellon freaks out over how many, uh, over the taxes, the wartime taxes that have had to go in place in order to fund World War I. And he starts to slash taxes. And then he also starts to offer rebates to people, big, big, um, you know, wealthy people secretly uh, to free up money. He also goes ahead and, and this I love, he goes to the head of the IRS and he asks the IRS how he can cheat on his taxes, hypothetically. The head of the IRS tells him, he goes ahead and he cheats on his taxes. And then he goes in front of the country and he said, see how easy it is to cheat on your taxes? I did it. This means we need to get rid of taxation altogether. And he writes about this um, uh, in pop popular media. He actually writes quite a bit. So if you're interested, you can read a lot of stuff that he's written about how bad taxes are. So what happens is that um, while they are doing that uh, and while they are starting to beef that up, uh, Harding's friends are using the government for their own interests. And this is where we get the Teapot Dome scandal. And I throw this in here just because it became so famous and because it became a symbol. But really, the, um, the, uh, the corruption in that administration was all over the map. But the Teapot Dome, it's just a, a great story. In fact, Teapot Dome is not the only place the scandal happened. It also happened in Elk Hills, California. But Elk Hills, California is not such a great name, right? The Teapot Dome scandal was simply that the Secretary of the Interior leased government oil lands to, um, to rich industrialists, primarily a guy named Ed Doheny. Um, who uh, literally shows up with a briefcase full of cash uh, at very low prices uh, because he was bribed. So he gives oil money, I mean, oil land to industrialists for very low prices because they bribed him. That's the Teapot Dome scandal. And it becomes a scandal. And interestingly enough, Doheny later on is going to argue that everybody in America is a Bolshevist. Uh, as he calls them, except him, basically. By 1930, he's ballistic. But of course, he's actually such the opposite of a Bolshevist. He is literally bribing government officials in uh, in the 1920s. All right. So, um, uh, so you've got scandals like that. And in the midst of all this, um, Harding realizes he's in real trouble. It's not just that the Veterans Affairs Administration is in trouble, but that's more complicated. So people don't really grab hold of it. All this stuff's coming to a head. Harding realizes his administration is in trouble. A journalist actually comes and sees him one night and says, you know, you know, he, the, Harding says to the journalist, he says, you know, it's not my friends that are, it's not my enemies that are causing my trouble, you know, expletive, it's my friends. And he goes on a trip to California, to the West, to kind of uh, clear his head. Interestingly enough, he makes Hoover come along, and Hoover really disdains him. He thinks he's a child. He actually calls it who, uh, Harding's friends, Harding's playmates. And Hoover's a very good uh, Hoover's a very good bridge player, and Harding makes him play bridge with them in the train car all up and uh, all down the West Coast when they're going down the West Coast. And Hoover hates it so much he never plays bridge again. But on this trip in California, Harding uh, dies, and as I say, um, probably of a heart attack. Although there are rumors that his wife kills him, I don't think she kills him. Um, be a great story, but I don't think she does. All right, so that puts. Calvin Coolidge in charge. And Calvin Coolidge is famous for saying the business of America is business. He actually never says that. He says something very similar to that, but that quote is wrong. But yes, he intends to put businessmen in charge of the US government. And he intends to do so on principle. I mean, that's the funny thing about it is because Coolidge believes that um, if you really just put business in charge of the government, everything is gonna be brilliant perfect, better than perfect. And if you think about everything I've told you about the Republican Party, the landslide election of 1920 and the follow-up election of 24 is the, the first time that Republicans have been 100% in control of American government since 1873. And you know, in the immediate reconstruction years, they didn't really know what they were doing is the argument. So now with complete Republican control of the country, they're going to make the country shine. And this is exactly what should happen. The government should work with business. This is what Republicans in the circle believe. And Republicans, um, uh, and, and with Hoover and Mellon, 
in charge of the industrial policy and the, um, the, the economy and the financial policy of the country, what they do is they pump money into the economy. Now, again, they, we don't yet know Keynesian economics. We don't yet understand the relationship between finance and the economy. And what Mellon thinks is so long as he can pour more and more money into the economy, the better everything will be. So in addition to the tax cuts, in addition to the rebates, there is, no re there is no regulation of the financial markets at this point, remember, none. So what happens is that banks permit uh, borrowers to, um, to they're, they're very lax about borrowing, but they also, and there's no regulation on the securities, in the, uh, on uh, Wall Street in stocks. So what happens is uh, stocks start to rise, and as stocks start to rise, people are allowed to borrow money, to, to buy stocks on margin. So if you wanted to buy a stock that was worth, and I'm going to make this up, $100 or stock, $100 worth of stocks, you could put down, say, $20 and pay for the rest of that stock with the dividends from the purchase as the stock went up. That's called buying on margin. And what people did is, people who had any money at all, is they began to invest in the stock market buying on margin. And this, of course, pumps more and more money into the stock market. You know exactly where this is going. And it looks great. Things look absolutely great. The 1920s look, and I'm emphasizing that word for a reason, look terrific because you have innovation. You have a consolidation of a lot of little stores into big stores, and that seems at the time like a good idea. Uh, big stores that have things in them like nylon stockings, which become available for popular use. Women can wear nylons. You have radios. Radios are huge, so for the first time, people can actually sit and listen to music piped into their houses, and entertainment, things that you otherwise didn't have access to. Um, country music, you know, this is when it takes off, when the Grand Old Opry takes off in this period. You have uh, uh, automobiles, you have uh, new kinds of clothing, you have um, household appliances, washing machines. Uh, a friend of mine once, I once asked a friend of mine who was born in um, 1896 what the, was the biggest change in her lifetime, the most important thing in her lifetime, and she said the washing machine. There were six of us. Until the washing machine, we did laundry all the time. As soon as we had a washing machine, she said, she could listen to the radio. They took time off to listen to the radio, and she could go out in cars with boys. Uh, much to the chagrin of her parents, I'm sure, some people at the time called cars, houses of prostitution on wheels, because again, think of what this means. It means for the first time, people can get away from their parents. They can get into automobiles and go places. They can go out to see things. They can see films, for example. And, um, and there just feels to be this incredible um, burgeoning of consumer goods in America in the 1920s. And it's a burgeoning that's fed by the rise of advertising because out of World War I, we get the concept of propaganda, which is what it's called at the time, that has been pushed by the government during World War I from the CPI, the Committee on Public Information. But after that, uh, after the war, those same people who worked for the CPI actually went into advertising and they start to convince people that their lives will be good if only they have the latest um, whatever, uh, the latest hair product, or um, or you know if you if you really have a great personality and you wear this newfangled stuff called deodorant because this is when we invent the concept of bo body odor, you might get a ride in that nice Chris Craft boat that that nice boy has next door. This is all a product of the 1920s, and everything looks ducky in the magazines. Everything looks great about the economy. Unfortunately, I, you know, I realize every time I say something like that, there's always a but, right? But that image of the booming 1920s economy really was limited to a very small group of Americans. And it tended to be white Americans who lived in areas that were accessible to urban centers. So Southerners, and Westerners and minorities uh, did not have access to that sort of, hey, it's the roaring 20s kind of, um, 
of eco economy. And they said so, and they said, we're in trouble, you know, and the more they said that, and you see this really dramatically from the farmers in the West, the more the farmers in the West said, uh, we've got a huge problem out here, the more uh, the Coolidge administration and, Har and, um, and Herbert Hoover said, nah, you, your problem is you're not working hard enough. What you really need to do is work harder, and what you really need to do is be more efficient, join the modern economy. The problem is you, the problem isn't the system. So what you ended up with by um, 1928 is the idea that um, that with the Republicans in control of everything, in control of the government, they'd figured it out. They had finally managed to wed um, the economy with the government, and it had created a world that was so successful that one of the things that happens in the 1920s is we stop having reform movements because everyone, everyone that is all the people who are reading the magazines and writing the magazines say, we don't need to help the poor any longer because our economy is so great, there will be no poor very shortly. We actually have the triumph of uh, the American system. And it's so great that one of the most popular books that's written in the 1920s is a book that describes Jesus as a businessman who has managed to take um, 12 nobodies and turn them into the most effective corporation in America, in world history. And that book about, um, about how even Christianity has become a portrait of American business is just so perfectly apt for the 1920s because of course what we get is the election of 1928. And the election of 1928 is so important as a symbol I think for us right now because when the election of 1928 happened, Herbert Hoover won in a landslide had control of the country, not the same landslide as 1920, but but the Republicans had just wrapped up the country. It was just a clean sweep. And um, and he, he gave an inaugural address in which he said, we are on track to perfection. We are on track to eliminating poverty forever here in America. You know this is not going to last. I'm going to leave you with it right there. You can pick it up next week. I hope this has been useful. Again, my name is Heather Richardson, Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a professor of history. I do not speak for my employer when I do these. And uh, I will see you next week when the Republican miracle collapses. Thanks for coming along.